Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 23rd, 2024 Newburn Board of Aldermen meeting. And the prayer tonight is going to be given by Alderman Royal. Thank you, Mayor. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for another opportunity to gather together. We thank you, God, that as we believe that our negotiations and our deliberations will be conducted in fairness and justice and equity. We pray tonight for your wisdom, your knowledge of who you are, and that it will guide our decisions. We pray for our citizens, God, how you keep us safe in the midst of all of the cold, those that are homeless, those that are dis disenfranchised. We pray for peace within our city. And above all, we thank you, God, for all that you do and all that you keep. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you're able to stand, please do so as we pledge allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, if you would please call the roll. Alderman Friel? Here. Alderman Royal? Here. Alderman Astor? Here. Mayor Odom? Here. Alderman Kinsey? Here. Alderman Best? Present. Alderman Brinson? Here. Okay, board item number three is to approve the agenda. Are there any changes anyone would like to make? Yes, I spoke with the manager earlier. We're going to, uh, 13, we're going to discuss that during our retreat in February. Okay, so we want to table item number 13 until the retreat. And what date is that again? February. That is February 6th. February 6th. Uh, is that your motion, sir? Yes, sir, it is. Second. I have a motion and a second to table item number 13 to February the 6th. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, as far as the rest of the agenda, would I entertain a motion to approve? So moved. I have second. a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The agenda is approved. Next is the consent agenda. It's a pleasure of the board. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, make a motion to take item six out of the consent agenda and move it to the action items. Okay. So we can discuss it. And to approve the consent agenda. And to approve right? the consent agenda as amended. Okay. I have a motion. Do we have a second? second? We have a second, Alderman Astor. Any further discussion? Hearing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Prill. Alderman Prill? Yes. Alderman Royal? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Alderman Best? Yes. Alderman Burnson? Yes. Mayor Odom? Yes, motion carries. So now we will look at item number six, and that is to consider adopting a resolution in opposition of the North Carolina Rate Bureau's request for homeowners insurance rate increase. Alderman Brinson. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Just wanted to highlight for our citizens what this was uh, all about. Our uh, North Carolina Rate Bureau, which represents the insurance companies and insurance policies in the state of North Carolina, has put a list of proposed increases into the uh, state insurance commissioner and for the coastal areas of Beaufort, Camden, Chowan, Craven, Jones, Pasquotank, Perquimans, Terrell, and Washington counties are proposing 25.6% increase in homeowners insurance. Uh, and, and it goes up from there. Uh, Duplin and the Noor counties at 71.3%. Uh, coastal areas in uh, Carteret and Onslow is 71%, and then even um, beach areas in Onslow and Carteret are 99.4%. Again, these are proposals. Uh, so the Commissioner of Insurance is asking for input, and so now there are uh, cities and municipalities that are putting in uh, like we are considering tonight, a resolution opposing those. Uh, citizens that want to uh, put their own comments in can send it to 2024, which is 2024 homeowners 
at ncdoi.gov no later than February 2nd. And uh, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so um, look to have a motion to approve the resolution. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution um, in opposition to the North Carolina Rate Bureau's request for homeowners insurance rate increase. Second. Second. I have a motion and a lot of seconds. <laughs> um, any further discussion? Hearing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Royal. Alderman Royal? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Alderman Bess? Yes. Alderman Brinson? Yes. Alderman Creel? Yes. Mayor Odom? Yes. Motion carries. Move on to item number eight is a presentation of 2023 crime report by Chief Gallagher. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of the board, Foster, uh, Marvin. Um, before I go any further, I do want to make one quick statement. Um, I've been here three years and finally somebody recognized the beauty of the skyline that's right out here. And New Bern was um, uh, voted the number one uh, picturesque skyline small city in all of America. So I just think that's a phenomenal uh, feather in our cap and I just figured I'd share that with you. Um, before I go any further, also I do want to um, thank the men and women of the New Bern Police Department. The crime stats that I will speak about are a direct relationship to the hard work that each of them have applied in achieving our mission. also want to thank the uh, wonderful people of New Bern who have partnered with us um, in a shared um, uh, mission to reduce crime and the fear of crime. So um, on this particular slide, um, I have aggregate data for 20, 21, 22, 23, and an average. The following slides, I will only compare 22 with 23, but there's also a column in which we compare the average over three years. What you saw on that slide um, is for the most part, great news. Um, we, as a police department, report, like almost every other police department in the United States, crime stats to the FBI specific to two categories, well, to part one crimes that are either violent crime or property crime. This is so that the community and citizens can have a apple-to-apple -apple comparison about crimes throughout the country. So the data that I share with you will be parsed out between either violent crime or property crime. And what we've noticed um, over the past three years, specifically in 2023, we saw a huge reduction in violent crime. That nothing uh, creates more fear of crime than the crimes of violence. And the needle is uh, clearly turning in our favor. Um, we believe that this is a direction we hope to replicate moving forward. If you take the three-year comparison, um, it, the decrease is also very significant um, at almost 28%. Uh, property crime, however, uh, did increase by 1% uh, compared to that of the previous year, um, but was down if you compare it over the course of three years. So to give you another comparison, property crimes across the state and across the nation has increased. This is uh, not new for the city of New Bern uh, or our region. However, I will say it is uh, very positive that the increase was only 1%. In many other localities, that percentage is significantly higher. What I also have on this uh, slide is the number of calls for service that were dispatched to our patrol officers in 2023, which was just slightly uh, over 37,000 times uh, a police officer is dispatched to a crime. And I want you to 
to consider that as I move through the next series of slides because what I wanted to do was to provide some context into um, what does this mean depending on where do you live in the city of New Bern. Um, in the case of the Battleground Community Policing District, um, you can see that significantly fewer calls for service uh, occurred in um, in that region, 4.8% um, of all of our calls, which represented just slightly more than 18, uh, 1,800 calls for service. So the crime data that you see, I've only given, only comparing 22 to 23, um, and in almost all cases, um, the crime data has decreased. Uh, what I will say about the um, Battleground Community District is the pool of numbers is so small that when you have zero and then the next year you have one, that represents a 100% increase. Um, so I, I, I want to contextualize that. The, um, in fact, I was at the Taberna uh, Homeowners Association meeting before this meeting um, and my message to them was uh, that you live in a very safe area of the city. And my message to the entire city of New Bern, you live in a very safe uh, community and we will strive to make it even better. So uh, if Chief, we, Chief, right for a moment, excuse yeah. me. When you make mention of the um, policing district, would you mind letting us know what communities comprise each district, if you would. Well, I, I've tried to overlay that with the with the map that's with on the, the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, so, with respect, uh, yes. Yeah, so, if you if you notice uh, the um, uh, somewhat uh, violet color, mm -hmm. all of that represents the area of the battleground, which is Taberna and Carolina colors for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, Country Club, which represents almost 20% of all of our calls for service. Um, we had uh, 2,700 calls for service there. And as you can see, even in that area, um, which uh, Alderman Royal, I believe that Pembroke would be in the Country Club uh, District, we have almost in every category a reduction in part one, violent and property crimes. In the uh, Greenleaf District, which is uh, the uh, yellow area di um, displayed, the violent crime is down. Now, if you see aggravated assault, when you go from four to five, it is a 25% increase. However, if if you look at a five-year average, we're, we're right at zero. Now, one of your questions might be, well, why is property crime increasing in this area? Well. Um, anecdotally, I can tell you that if you look at this district, you have a lot of business um, along the MLK corridor, which drives a lot of the property crimes that we see um, based on the uh, reports that were taken. Um, in the Gateway Community Policing District, again, about 20 percent, uh, almost 21 percent of all of our uh, calls for service were uh, were dispatched to this area. Again, the uh, violent crime down, property crime up slightly. If you look at arson, you see, again, you see such a high number, but the pool is just so, so small, uh, the comparison becomes a little bit misleading. Um, one of the things that I will point out, and I point out all the time, and I, I, I wish it wasn't something that I have to say, but it was in this district where a 19-month-old was was murdered uh, based on a, um, a shooting incident. And uh, I, I continually ask our community to assist us in that investigation. Um, we, we are desperate to clear this case and bring justice to Nealoni Sheptak. Um, in the News River Community Policing District, um, again, r roughly about the same, 18%. Um, of our calls for service generated out of there. All categories of violent crime is down, um, down significantly. But uh, again, it, when you look at, for instance, homicide, when you have one and then you have zero, again, it, it's uh, 
Um, to be down 100% is a wonderful thing, but you go from one to zero. So I just want to contextualize that. Uh, probably the most calls for service uh, uh, Alderman Best are in the uh, Washington Forks area. Um, but again, we see violent crime is down. The call volume may be uh, higher, um, but I, I think the stats would reflect a comment that I made that we believe that the citizens of New Bern do live in a safe community. One of the things that I want to uh, <clears throat> provide specifically to this body and anybody that's listening is that we, when we compare ourselves against our comparison other, it helps us contextualize, well, what does it mean, Chief, when you say you live in a safe community? Um, well, what we stri strive to do is to look at communities that are similar to ours. And we found 17, uh, well, we added Havelock. Havelock's a bit of an outlier, but we found 16 communities that had a similar size to New Bern, plus or minus uh, 5,000. And we compared the crime data, the same data that we reported out on, it's the same data that those municipalities are reporting out on. And we compared it to the latest crime data available. Now, we are the city of New Bern. We collect our own data. We have all of our data for 2023. 2023 data will not be published by the FBI probably until the summer of this, of 2024. But we do have complete data for 2022. <laughs> and so when we look at all the cities in the great state of North Carolina that fit that criteria, and again, we added Havelock because they're so close to us, we find that these are the cities that uh, fit that criteria. When you overlay their crime rate with the city of New Bern's crime rate, you can see that we fall below the average in terms of total part one crimes. Um, one of the issues that has come up, and it's a little bit disconcerting for me, is when I see open source data uh, websites that profess to provide crime data about the city of New Bern, and I look at this data and I say, it is simply not correct. And so what we've learned was, it's where is, where are these open source data gather, sites gathering their data from. And we recommend that anybody that wants to do their own data mining, that there are three sources that we recommend that you go to. The first one is our LexisNexis crime map, which any citizen has the right to go on and, and pull crime data that is reported in the city of, of New Bern. Uh, obviously, the FBI is the, the, the core source where uh, that data can be pulled from, and also the uh, North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation Summary Statistic Review data. That's data that is correct. Now, what ends up happening is, and I showed this, and I want to thank Alice for helping me um, with the GIS, is the data that is pulled from a lot of these sources are pulled from addresses. So there's a lot of places, and if you notice on this uh, overlay map, all of that blue area that is Craven County is captured in the open source crime data that is specific to the city of New Bern. If you live in James City, you have a New Bern address. You write on your uh, envelope, New Bern, North Carolina. If you live in Trent Woods, you write New Bern, North Carolina. You do not live in the city of New Bern, but all of that crime data that these open source um, websites are pulling from is pulling from this entire region. So it is uh, not correct data when they compare the city of New Bern in terms of all of the crime data that they're gathering um, is it needs to be better contextualized. Um, <clears throat> well, I, 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 I've passed my slide presentation. Before I go any further, I do want to provide a couple other pieces of information that I think is relevant, and um, hopefully if you have questions, uh, maybe some of the things that I'm going to mention right here uh, might be addressed. The first thing I want to 
uh, speak about us with some of the strategies that we have in the city of New Bern about the deployment of our staff and how best to address not only crime but, but traffic safety is we use traffic stops for a variety of purposes, one of which is to educate drivers specific to uh, their driving behavior, whether or not they've committed a traffic in violation or not. By the way, our traffic data, uh, a traffic stop data reflects that 56% of all vehicles that are stopped drive away with a warning. That's education. Not everybody deserves a summons or a ticket, but there are other reasons why we stop vehicles. Um, and part of that is um, obviously traffic, but also there's a certain amount of criminality that is associated with driving behavior, and uh, that nexus is one that is replicated throughout the country. Criminals use cars when they commit crimes, and oftentimes citizens will see a car pulled over and they'll see not one patrol car, maybe not two patrol cars, maybe they see three patrol cars, associated with a traffic stop and they question and wonder why do you have so many police officers at something as uh, 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 as minimal as a traffic stop it depends it is situational and it depends on why why that vehicle was stopped one of the rules of thumbs has always been in policing whether or not you're policing in north carolina or any place in the united states is you always want to have one additional police officer more than the persons in the car. If you have two people in the car, you want three police officers. That's an officer safety issue. So um, I, I want to provide that context. Another thing that happens during traffic stops is we find out that the person in the car is either has a license problem or is wanted. Um, and we make quite a number of arrests based solely on running something as germane as their driver's license, and that, is, that also comes with an NCIC check to determine if they're wanted for other uh, criminal acts. The other thing I want to talk about is partnerships, not just our community police partnerships, which I'll talk about in just one second, but the partnerships that we have with other law enforcement or are criminal justice entities, and one of the best partnerships that we have is that with the Craven County Sheriff's Office, but also with our DA, and one of the things that I, I, I cannot praise uh, our U.S. Attorney and the U.S. Attorney's Office more is they have taken a real interest in the partnerships that we have made and the efforts that we have made in curving violent crimes, specifically uh, drug dealers, gang members, and those involved in gun violence. I've often said I have a lot of sympathy for persons that are addicted to drugs. They need treatment. I have zero tolerance and zero patience for anyone that sells drugs in the city of New Bern, anybody involved in gang activity, or those people that use firearms in a way that will result in something like I spoke about with uh, Neilani Sheptok. I had a press conference where I made it very, very clear that as far as I'm concerned, my number one mission is to reduce crime and to fear of crime, and one of those is to reduce gun violence. It's one of the reasons why we are bringing on ShotSpotter. The people that live in our community deserve a place that is safe for them and their family. And as long as I'm the chief of police here, we will focus our law enforcement efforts specifically on those three issues. I am very aware, and I'll speak about the community policing aspect in just a second, but th th there are areas where we should have zero tolerance, and there are areas that we can work towards building uh, stronger community outreach efforts for persons that are homeless, persons that are addicted, or persons that suffer from mental illness. The other thing is, and, and those community partnerships involve the faith-based um, elements and community civic leagues. These are very, very important because the faith-based community is the heart and soul of New Bern, and the civic leagues speak to the representative government of a neighborhood, specifically just coming back from one in uh, Taberna. 
Crime analysis is another huge element of what we do. We want to be evidence-based and uh, um, uh, intelligence-led in what we do. All of our patrol officers, when they're on the street, they ought to have the correct crime data and analysis work so that they know where to be, when to be, to uh, deter crime or enforce crime. Visibility is another critical issue with the New Bern Police Department. Our officers need to be seen. They need to be seen in the communities and the neighborhoods. Our strategy and our expectations that our officers don't just drive up and down MLK and, and, and the, the major thoroughfares. They need to get into the community so that, so that the residents see that there is a patrol car patrolling their neighborhood. That is critically important. Um, planning and training is always critical. Not only does the police department support the city's emergency operation plan, but the police department also has its own emergency operation plan specific to the police department. Not only does the city of New Bern have a strategic plan, so does the police department. We plan uh, for uh, achieving our mission. We have a young police department, and it is critically important to provide all of our officers that do very specific jobs to have the core ability to achieve their mission. And the last one I want to talk about, and then I'll open it up for questions, is the New Bern Police Department is, our, our um, intention is to engage in best practice operations. And one of the best ways to do that is through accreditation, through CALEA, which is the uh, international policing body that um, uh, determines best practices. There are over 400 standards. The city of New Bern meets uh, or exceeds all of those standards. And I'm proud to stand here before you to tell you that we will achieve our seventh reaccreditation through national standards. Um, I will be in Alabama in March to receive uh, our seventh accreditation. So with that, I, I am available for questions. We have questions. Alder McKenzie. <coughs> Chief. How many murders did we have last year? Four. How many were solved? I am, um, I don't believe that we've cleared any of the four that we have. So what have been your, what's, what is your strategy this year? to look back on what wasn't achieved last year? Well, there's, there's two ways to look at that. If we're talking about a crime, a murder that occurred within the past 24 months, that's an active case. We continue to work that case as an active homicide case until all the leads have been exhausted. I, I want to make something pretty clear. Um, our detectives are very good at what they do. And when I tell you we know, well, there's a difference between knowing something and proving beyond a reasonable doubt. No, I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. Proving something at the level of a conviction, and that's what the prosecutor's going to want. And uh, knowing it beyond a reasonable doubt is a very high standard. And when we seek to obtain cooperation amongst the witnesses of our community to help us prosecute these cases, that's critically important. So uh, there's a difference between knowing who killed one of our citizens and proving it is a high bar. And one of the strategies, to, to your point, um, Alderman Kinsey, is we make it very easy to provide the New Bern Police Department with information anonymously. They are free to provide us with information that's actionable. Um, and we rely on that. We also rely on those in our community that have said enough is enough and I'm not going to let another 19-month-old child perish in this community without saying something and doing something. We need people willing to testify and that is critically important. 
Um, the other part, and, and I gave you that 24-month period, that's generally when a case becomes cold. And we are amongst a very few smaller departments. And, then, you know, we're not a Raleigh, we're not a Charlotte, uh, but we're a small department, and we have a version of, of a cold case review team. What I will be requesting in the upcoming budget is a cold case investigator. Cold case investigations is a very unique set of skill sets. It's not something that the average investigator is going to be good at. Cold case investigations requires somebody who is able to pick up a case from 30 years ago and recreate best possible the uh, uh, new evidence based on new technologies and new uh, uh, methods uh, of evidence building to make a case. This happens in the United States all the time, um, but it is something that we in New Bern want to be able to provide to our community that we're doing everything that we can to solve a case that occurred 30 years ago. They do become more difficult. That's why th there's a TV show called The First 48 Hours. There's a reason why 48 hours is the, is the window of opportunity to clear murder cases. After 48 hours, notwithstanding 48 months, it becomes increasingly more difficult to solve these cases. Tell me this, Chief. Um, <clears throat> what difference in manpower in surveillance that you're doing differently now in those areas that crime has not been resolved? What are you doing different? Uh, I, I misunderstood your question. Are you talking about surveillance? Yes, sir. What are you doing different? Is anything different that you have? You say partners. You say um, we're going to do this and do that. Um, have you... What have you done different? So I can tell you that uh, over the past six months, we have met with uh, members of a violent crime, for lack of a better word, uh, task force, in which we meet with all of our local law enforcement entities, um, uh, probation and parole, the district attorney's office, and the, and the uh, U.S. attorney's office that come in here into New Bern, and we case manage every person whom which we believe we can link crime to and hopefully leverage the the powers of the federal court system um, to reduce violent crime when we focus now we're not focusing on burglars in this context we're focusing on people that are known gang members and persons that are involved in drug dealing and the drug dealing network uh, network that uh, that finds its way in the city of New Bern and also those with, with gun charges to use the federal system to help us. We have indicted several since we began this, this operation. We are pulling a lot of very violent people off the streets. We uh, Numerous arrests have occurred. Now I can tell you the conditions that create criminality is far beyond that which law enforcement can impact. This is not a system in which law enforcement has the solution. This, this is a much, much bigger problem. The amount of fentanyl that comes into this country, the, the ability to cut fentanyl and create a similar product. Fentanyl is an opioid-based uh, product. Heroin is and oxycodone and some of these other products, the things that our community is addicted to, the market is out there. And the supply side is incredibly profitable. Um, and to impact that is going to take a lot more than just law enforcement efforts. And, and I'm here to tell you, we put a lot of effort into that. Um, I don't know if I have the full solution. I can tell you if I had the solution to this, um, I don't think anybody has the absolute solution to this. Well, this is something that I feel that I'm, I feel comfortable that I can speak for the board. This is something that we feel that enough is enough and the safety of the people as well as you that we need to really 
crunch down and crunch hard because once uh, a nest is built, that's where they live, in the nest. And they have to be taken out of the nest. And um, I like to see you become a little harder than what you are, a little tougher than what you are. I'm just speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for the other board members. Um, when you lose a kid, a baby, and then the other guys come along, I know how you feel probably about the same thing that I'm saying. Something has to be done. Something has to be done. Do you have meetings in the communities? I don't know. I'm just asking questions. Uh, do you have meetings in those same communities that uh, this thing taking place? Do you go in and meet with the people? Um, the guys used to walk through my neighborhood, but I haven't seen nobody in a long time. Um, it's, it's different approaches that you have to take when you're dealing with bad people. It's a different approach. A lot of times people get afraid. People don't talk. Um, they just, they're quiet. As you know that, that's the reason why you probably haven't solved anything because don't nobody tell on nobody. But you can't be afraid. You got to stand up for what you believe in. Sometimes you might lose your life, but you got to stand up for what you believe in. You can't be afraid. Well, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I've been doing this since the 1980s. Been a police officer very long time. I know what I'm dealing with. I know who I'm dealing with. Okay. I know the, the obstacles associated with why some of these cases are very difficult. But here's something else that I also know. We're not going to disenfranchise anyone simply because they happen to live in a place that is wrought with violence. We have to be specific as to who we address our law enforcement efforts. There's a thing called presence of justice. In New York City, they reduced crime by something that was called stop and frisk. Everyone gets stopped and everyone gets frisked. The wrong people get stopped and the wrong people get frisked. When I tell you I understand that, I understand that. And when I go into the communities and I do speak, in fact, the one uh, uh, community group that I all, the chief of police goes to is the Greater Duffy Field Residence Council. I go to every one of those and I have my crime stats with me and I stand before that community and I listen to their concerns and I address those. And I will not be a chief of police in a community that because you happen to live in one that is a violent place that somehow you become disenfranchised and stopped by the police for doing nothing but walking down the street. I talked about evidence-based and intelligence-led and crime analysis. I, we, when we meet with the U.S. attorneys, these are the federal attorneys. I've been doing this a long time. I've never seen... A, a U.S. attorney come in and say, we want to help you prosecute crimes. Never seen it. They solicited us to come here because of the relationship between our team and the Craven County Sheriff's team. And we have the names of every gang member in New Bern, and we cross-reference those with what can we charge them with because we don't want to disenfranchise somebody who's doing nothing more than wanting to go to their job and come back or do something as simple as walk through their neighborhood. Well, I've seen those people come here before before I became an alderman. <clears throat> they came in with, in Craven Terrace and they spoke. And they spoke real loud and real hard. That's when they had a substation over there in the projects. That's what I seen, and I was there. So uh, I seen that, and I'm pretty sure um, you can do what you want to do or do what you need to do. But um, fear keeps people separated. It keeps people divided, you know. Uh, anger, power, 
someone would come in and divide just Jeff and I up because they know that we're going to get in the way. So they try to divide us up. And we got to overcome those kind of obstacles. Um, I know what I'm talking about. A lot of people may not understand. I know a lot of them may have never been in crime. I know what crime is all about. But um, you have to step hard and be willing to do what you got to do. That's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Alderman Pru. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Alderman Kinsey, um, one answer to your inquiry of the chief as to what is being done as a result of specifically, say, the four uh, murders that have taken place is that the chief of the police department is moving forward with the shot spotter program. And, Chief, I don't know exactly where that's at, but I assume that it's coming online soon if it isn't already online. So I would suspect that a year from now, when the chief is before us um, doing the same annual review, but including this year in that review, um, I, I would expect that that shot spotter program is probably going to uh, play a big role in any crime that has taken place uh, within the district that it covers. I don't understand what you're saying. I asked him about the murders that was that has not been solved. I'm not talking about having a system set up. This has already happened. This is after the fact what you're talking about. I mean, you, you asked the chief what, you're saying. what is being done as a result of those murders. The shot spotter program is a program that is being implemented in part because of those murders. I think you need to acknowledge that. I don't think you understand what I'm saying. Apparently um, I don't. Evidently you don't. Um, I just asked him, have the vendors solved? And he said no. And then you're going to talk about some system that they're going to put in place. That's good that they put the thing in place, but the cases have not been resolved. Chief, okay? Chief if I could, um, if I could um, you mentioned something about knowing who committed the crime or murder versus being able to bring them to justice. That's correct. Um, the missing piece, I believe, is input from the community, and that's why you have begged and pleaded with the community to step up, um, you know, when there's a, a murder that takes place in broad daylight in Trent Court uh, in the afternoon, and <clears throat> the folks there know where the cameras are, and they know to put something and mask their face so they won't be recognized. However, the people in the community know who that individual is, and if they would simply step up anonymously mm -hmm. and provide some tips and some details, we could close probably all four of those, including some other ones. So whatever we can do to help implore the community to step forward, we, we desperately need that. I think um, I should provide a little bit more context in um, Alderman Kinsey's question about what is different. What is different is there's been a parade of defendants that are facing federal charges right now that did not happen a year ago. That is a huge impact on the criminal element. So the reduction of violent crime in our community, I believe, has a direct relationship with what we are doing, what we have done, and what we will continue to do. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. And I started this by thanking the men and women that actually do this job. And then I thank the community for their support. But I also implore the community to continue to assist us so that we don't have another situation. Because the predator that is allowed to continue to victimize our community is the same one that is protected by the community that's being victimized. I've said this numerous times. The Constitution provides 
that the government has the obligation and duty to prove a person's guilt because they are presumed innocent until evidence that the prosecutor can accept and can win in court. That's the beauty of living in this country. We have freedoms. We have presumption of innocence. My job is tremendously more difficult without the assistance of our community. I'm not just speaking of Pat Gallagher. I'm speaking about every chief that has to deal with these same issues. Chief, let me get all the best first. All the best. Um, chief, I just want to thank you and your staff for all the hard work that you have done. And I know that you're continued, will continue to do to keep our um, city and our citizens safe. But um, I do have to comment on the fact that, and, and I do understand um, when it comes to the citizens and citizens coming forth and, and that would aid you in your investigations and could possibly solve some of the, these crimes but, and, and, and homicides. But, you know, speaking from a perspective of, you, you got to understand where a lot of the crimes are taking place. The citizens that are involved, they are afraid to come forth. They are afraid to speak. They have to live in that community, and they have to live with those drug dealers and, and those violent individuals that create the crimes and stuff. So I, I understand from a perspective that you do need that support from the community. But it's kind of hard when you live in a community and you're afraid. But just continue to do the work that you and your staff is doing, and hopefully with the aid of the Sheriff's Department and the FBI and any other sources that we can really get ahead of the game here in our city and, and move forward with it and protect our citizens. So thank you. I think you, you all have been best. And when I spoke of the conditions that mm -hmm. create criminality, that's one of them. Mm -hmm. Alderman Chief, question for you. Um, have we reached out to the FBI or the Attorney General's office or whoever, even to the state of North Carolina, to see if we can get reward money to help resolve some of these murders? I know some, and there's a lot of, sometimes you see where there's a lot of reward money posted for information. And I was just wondering if we could get some assistance from the state or the federal government with some reward money? Well, um, to answer your question, we, we did seek uh, additional funding for um, a reward for the Neilani Sheptak case, um, despite the fact that uh, we were able to raise some monies, and I was, I was uh, to be candid with you, disappointed in the amounts of monies that we were able to, to obtain. And, and, and much of that came from the Craven County Crime Stoppers um, that still did not uh, produce the uh, type of information that we wanted. But you're talking about $1,000, right? Oh, no, I mean, it, it, it was much more than that. I don't remember what the total was, but it was far more than $1,000. I was wondering if we could reach out to the state attorney general and try to get some state funds or something like that to offer a five or $10,000 reward. Money will make people talk. You know, um, I mean, it's worth a try maybe, I don't know. But I also want to thank you and your staff for everything that you do. I know you work hard. Uh, and I'm, you keep them safe, and that's the big thing. But you also protect our community, and I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. You're doing a great job. Any more questions? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay, item number nine is to conduct a public hearing and consider adopting a resolution approving leases with Newburn Baseball LLC for Kafer Park at 603 George Street, Mr. Hughes. Mayor, in July of this past year, the Old North State League uh, and Alec Allred, they made a presentation to the board regarding using Kafer Park for a summer collegiate baseball league. Um, after that meeting, uh, the city did a survey uh, regarding uh, checking our citizens to see if there was interest in this, and there was 
very good support for that. Mr. Allred also spoke at the Omega Center at a public meeting that was well attended and got good feedback from that as well. Subsequently, the board gave uh, myself and the attorney authorization to enter into negotiations for uh, uh, to negotiate a contract to lease Kafer Park. And this evening, we're asking you to ha have a public hearing and consider adopting a resolution approving these leases. There are two leases uh, that we're talking about. One is for the park itself, and the other is a separate lease for the concession stand. Total annual payments over a nine-year period would be twenty thousand. Uh, $22,222.22. .22. Happy to answer any questions you may have. And Mr. Allred is also here to answer any questions you may have as well. Board have questions before the public hearing? Would you repeat that statement you just made over a period of time? You said how much? Nine, nine years, the annual payment is $22,222.22. .22. Of course, um, Mr. Allred. Uh, in his proposal, wanted to do some upfits to the park, and so those upfits are in lieu of payment as he continues to, to improve that park. Okay, so the 20000 per year. You mentioned 22000 for nine years. The total, there are two separate leases. So One. you're speaking in terms of the concession stand for the twenty-two. Right, so for the park itself, $20,000. For the concession stand, $2,222.22. Thank you. Mr. Hughes, do we have a schedule worked out where the improvements that are called for are laid out in a timeline? Uh, if you would like, we can have Mr. Allred come up and he can and discuss his, his schedule. <coughs> Or we'll go ahead and open a public hearing. Is that okay? Okay. At this time, I'll open up a public hearing on <coughs> item number nine, which is the leases for Kafer Park and the concession stand. Mayor, City Manager, Council, appreciate the opportunity again to speak. Uh, absolutely, will answer any questions uh, anyone has. Uh, Do you want to talk about the proposed timeline if the if the agreement is approved? Yeah, so we, what we'll do is, uh, our goal is to go ahead and do all improvements year one, um, but the bigger projects like the grandstand, stuff like that, this will take time. We have, our season starts at the end of May, so as soon as this hopefully is approved, we'll begin work and get as much work done initially as we possibly can. I have a, I have a question. Um, the the dollar amount for the lease you mentioned something a minute ago that that is in lieu of the improvements so if they do improvements that are worth twenty thousand dollars for year one then they wouldn't pay the twenty thousand dollars the improvements would take that place is that correct? correct okay all right thank you so i think one of the concerns that i had heard from some folks is if you tie up the ballpark for nine years and they come in and make all the promises that they're going to do something and they don't do it, now you've tied it up. This provides a city a revenue stream for those nine years if they don't do the improvements. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And again, I think the question was to have the improvements. What we're hearing is vague. Um, Tentatively, is there a list of improvements that you are proposing to make? And if so, then where is that list? Yes, ma'am, I, I don't mind jumping in here. We, we have a general list, mm -hmm. but I want you to have a very specific, precise list that you will approve or defer to the city manager to approve as they are provided. For example, improving the field and improving drainage improving dugouts, improving fencing, that's all nice, but we need to know precisely what do we mean when we say improve the fields and improve the dugouts. And that's what they're currently working on. So when they provide those specifications and engineer drawings and financial information to the city manager, he can bring it to you and it can be blessed so that they can then move forward with, with those issues. So we're trying to get it clear so that we all understand what is happening and that no one is surprised when there's an improvement made and you might not be aware of it. So then we are um, seeking to 
accept the contract, the lease. We're seeking for a resolution to approve the lease, and we're doing it blindly? No, ma'am. They, they are going to pay the city $20,000, but they have the option to come to the city manager and the board and propose to build a new stadium that costs $20,000. Mm -hmm. And if you're satisfied with that stadium and the dollar value attributed to it, you can approve, it, approve that. So that is their option. But if they do nothing, they will cut the city a check. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I may, I guess that was my question um, in paragraph 11 um, where you're addressing. It says the uh, leasee can only make changes, alteration, improvements on the premises with the prior written consent of the lesser. And so that was kind of, you alluded to it. I mean, that is my question when they do submit uh, requests in writing who are who's going to be the approval authority i guess what's the process and who's going to be the approval authority that was my yes in, sir. In, right in line Correct. with what you're talking about right now the only thing that in that is in this lease is the cameras Correct. in uh, exhibit b so any other improvements they will have to come back in exactly. writing exactly. saying this is what they're going to do um and I'm kind of looking at the board and looking at the city manager and saying, how, what does that process look like and who's the ultimate approval authority? It, the ultimate approval authority is this board. And okay. between this board and the city manager, you can work out whatever, whatever direction you're comfortable giving the city manager. But if, if there's no authority delegated to the city manager, those proposed improvements will have to come before you. Okay. I'm not ready to delegate that yet. What was that? I'm sorry, didn't you? I, I said I'm not ready to delegate that yet. It'll, it'll come to the board. Um, the other question that I had was um, paragraph 17 where it talks about assignment and subletting uh, <coughs> that the leasee may sublet uh, with regards to a permitted use not to exceed 14 days. Just uh, what... Uh, or who do you foresee subletting, or is this just a general paragraph that we don't have uh, an idea of how you're going to use it yet? And I understand the permitted uses, you can only use it for certain things. So. Yes, yeah, so subletting would be if we brought a, a college baseball program down from the Northeast to run a baseball tournament, try to get heads and beds and the hotels in the area. So it, okay. that would be that, that clearance for us to do stuff like that if said tournament. Um, wanted to run run an event in our field or at the field. That's all my question. I have another question. Sure. So, when the community want to access and utilize K for Park, they are to coordinate it with whom? They would they would reach out to the old North State League or or whoever the local person is. Okay. Thank you. Just want to be clear too. We're in a public hearing, so if anybody in the public would like to come up and speak for or against this item, you can. When when is your program scheduled to start at the field? Um, around May twenty fifth, last week of May. And the improvements that you're talking about completing in year one. You're really talking about improvements that need to be completed over the next three to four months, and not even four months probably at this point. So what level of confidence can you give us that all these improvements are going to happen over the next three months? Um, I, we've done it before. We did it in Pinehurst. We built a stadium from the ground up in a month and a half, Five, about a 1,000 capacity stadium in a month and a half because we got delayed by building uh, building inspectors and, and whatnot. Typical, typical things with dugouts and stuff like that. So we've done it before. Um, we've got a, a longer window here than we have in the past. So I feel very, very, very confident in that. But I think the lease is structured so that if one of the bigger projects like the grandstand isn't completed by year one, then there's, there's an out there in terms of we have to obligate our, our part of that lease if we can't get that that portion done. I want well, to if I'm sorry. Just yeah, that. just a follow up comment if I can. Um, it, it, 
I mean, at this point, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable, and that may not be the right word, of of having sort of every approval for improvements come back to this board because are we going to be creating delays for work getting done? And I don't know how many times you're going to be coming back to the city with proposals for improvements. It'd be nice to have them all laid out right up front that the board could review and approve them. But if it's going to be piecemeal, um, you're going to have to work around our meeting schedule, and I'd hate to see that cause delays. Yeah, I mean, we, we'll do it on our side. We'll do it however we need to. If we need to get a, a, an additional list, we, if we, um, if I've sent a list to the, the city manager, if we need to come with a whole list of everything down to speakers, um, stoves, like we'll do it all however we need to do it. If we need to do it up front at one time, if we need to do it over a period of time, we can do it that way. Um, We'll, we'll do what we'll do our part either way. I say, hey, me, ask her. Go ahead. Sorry. I, 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 I don't understand, unless I'm I, I've got the got it wrong, but it's my understanding that he's going to pay us twenty thousand dollars, and then if he or he's he's obligated for twenty thousand dollars, but then if he wants to build a stadium for five thousand dollars. That five thousand dollars comes off that twenty thousand that he. So it's. I mean, we can't. We really it'd be hard for us to, to lose, right? Th that's the plan, yes, sir. I think. <laughs> I think what's more likely to happen is that they'll, they'll spend fifty, sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars in the right. first six months and bank the next five years of payments based on their investment. I suspect that's how it's going to play out. Yeah. And to Alderman Prill's point, I think what would be helpful. I, given my experience with you, I, I suspect you're going to want some illustrations and some ideas about what what they're proposing. A list of equipment and things I, I don't think is going to help you and move the needle and improve your comfort level. I think, you know, for a dugout, I said engineer drawings, I, I don't literally mean engineer drawings for a dugout, but an illustration, paint colors, what is it that you're saying yes to so that when your constituents ask you can show them a picture. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Broadly? I, I'm just looking at the, uh, we're not talking about a year to get this done. We're talking about a few months at most before your season um, is scheduled to start. So I, I just would like a higher comfort level that the work that you intend to get done is going to get done in, in a very, a relatively short time frame. So. That's my primary concern. And I just don't want to see you having to come back before this board to get, you know, piecemeal approvals before you can start moving forward with those improvements. With so to the extent board. that all of that can be combined into a, a single one or two visits before us, I think it's better off for you, it's better off for us. Scott, would it come for the board or would it come to the manager for approval? Well, that's the issue I raised. Um, absent a delegation to the city manager, it has to come before you. Um, and I get off my Brinson's point, too. Part of this is we don't know what we all mean. You know, um, a, a minor improvement of $5,000 or less may sound commonsensical, unless it's painting the dugout and you don't like the orange color, and then we're all mad that the city manager approved the orange dugouts. So, so we're trying to find a way forward that is efficient to Autumn Prill's point, and, and maybe bundling as many of these things as we can with enough detail that makes you comfortable to approve it is gonna be where we end up. I had. I, I want to go back to community access. Is that spelled out in this lease agreement, in this contract? If we talked about subletting. That's right. Would the community, would that be the community subletting? Yes, ma'am. If, if they want, they, this will be their property 
for the next nine years. Correct, but that was my understanding initially when the presentation was made that the community could still have access to the property, but I understand the contract here. I just want to ensure that our community can still have some level of use of the property, whether it's through subletting or whatever the means are. Mr. Carpavara? Yes, I'd be happy to speak on that. So um, I first, I'm, I'm coming to you first as just a citizen um, and a parent of four kids that are looking for things to do in this town. I think what we're doing right now is we're getting bogged down in the weeds and we're not looking at the fact that this is another opportunity for adults and children to spend time together during the summer. This is a great opportunity to have another family event in a part of town that really could benefit from having more access, more people coming through. From that, I was able to see online that, that Alec was doing this, and I reached out to him. I came to the Omega Center, to the meeting that was there, and there was great support at the Omega Center for this from all members of the community. A lot was brought up about the area that it's in and how are we going to do that. So Alec and I talked a lot, and he has offered me the position of general manager of this team. With that in mind, I think that's where I'm going to be able to step in and allow access. I've been a youth coach in this area for over 20 years. I'm involved in baseball, basketball, football, anything that you can think of. And many children have come through here, um, young adults now that I've been involved with helping to coach. This is another way to bring those youth into things that are going on. So we will have events like... Um, you know, baseball clinics. We'll, we can do football clinics out there. We can have concerts. We can have parties for, for kids and, you know, you know, Friday night events. We can do all that stuff, and that would be through that leasing part is we can allow different areas, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to charge them to do that. It's going to depend on what type of event it is. A nonprofit event, more than likely we will not be doing that. We'll be helping them raise funds for the nonprofit. If it's a business that comes in, then that is probably an event that we're going to charge for, and we'll, we'll be able to supply. So we are going to run that field so it's being used year-round is the plan, not just the two and a half months of this baseball team. And with that said, some of you that have been here from the old New Bern River Rats, we have been missing something like that in this community, an event that people can come together. And I think the location of this field is perfect for what we're trying to do, and the location of the River Rats was not ideal for what we were trying to do, because I was part of that as well. So I hope that kind of answers a little bit of what you're saying, but we've got to look at the big picture. This is an event for families in our community that will take place for two and a half months, guaranteed, and we can do other things around that. Um, and we will be working with the Woodbat League, uh, the, the uh, Adult Men's Baseball League that's already there. We actually met with them today at the field and went over some of that as well. So we're not trying to kick them out either. We're trying to put, incorporate that into what we're doing. Are you local, sir? Yes, I have, uh, I have lived here for almost 30 years. My family is from here originally, so uh, I have been visiting here since I was born in the early 70s. And you. you were a recent New Bern 101 graduate. Correct? Yes, I just graduated from New Bern 101 uh, the last session. Great. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Paul McKenzie. So how soon can you have uh, the information to us? Uh, so what we've honestly been waiting for is the approval so we can start lining up contractors. We met with a fencing person today. We met with a uh, general contract. Uh, well, actually, we were supposed to meet with the general contractor. He did not show up, but I've been in touch with him. We've also met with a handyman that can help us with, like, building a ticket booth and things like that. So we've already got some things in line, and I'm also a local realtor, so I have a lot of connections through the community. So we're already behind the scenes because we didn't want to make an announcement working on getting people in place. So as soon as we know that we have access, we will be able to get the items lined up. Alec is the expert on that part of it. I am more of the public relations portion of, of what's going on. Alec has done this for 16 teams now. Is that what the league is at? 20. 20 teams. The league is at 20. So this is not just a fly-by-night item. We are at 20 teams, and uh, the league is even looking to expand into other states in the near future. So I don't have an exact timeline, but I do know that... It's hard for us to get a timeline until we know what we can commit to. So, the buck stops here. So, where are we at? And may I say one more thing? Sure. I truly believe that the ease of the transaction would be for us to go through Mr. Foster Hughes um, instead of having to come back up here for the, for the meetings and, and, and take up your time as well because he has been the recreation person and now a city manager. 
I think it's a really easy thing for him to transition into knowing the use of that field in the past and how it's, how, how, you know, how it's basically laid vacant for so long, essentially. Well, that's very good. He is the manager, but things come before the board. Absolutely. So it will be up to you guys to decide if that is okay to, to delegate that. I'm just giving my opinion on the process. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I too agree. It should go to the city Thanks, manager, and the city manager can reach out to the board members, and it's a whole lot faster than having to wait for a board meeting. Uh, I, I think the manager is quite capable of making the decisions and knows, you know, what needs to be done and what can be done. So we're still in a public hearing. If there's right. anyone else would like to speak from the public, make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So the public hearing is closed. So at this point, it is up to us to consider adopting the two leases um, as is before us. And I think from what I've surmised from the conversation, um, there are some of the opinion that everything needs to come back before the board before we approve any improvements. And I think there's some that say the city manager has the expertise and technical knowledge to approve that. Uh, the only question that I have is uh, assuming that the manager is going to look out for the interest of the city, clearly. Um, if the proposal comes back and they say they're going to put in bleachers, that's going to cost $100,000, and we know that they cost fifty. obviously the manager, I would hope, uh, you probably wouldn't be the manager long if you approve that. Um, would not approve that, and that way we would make sure that the finances match up with what the expenditures are. Um, but I do think it would be it would behoove all of us if we were to see something. I know we saw the proposals before when you came came up earlier, which which looked great. But something more concrete to say, hey, look, our our league starts the end of May. Realistically, this is what we expect to get done between now and May. Okay, and that is expected to be. $100,000 or $20,000, whatever you can find people to do that work. And then we can figure out from that point. But I think tonight is just approving the lease so they have the confidence in moving forward because they don't want to expend money and more time and energy if they can't get this lease approved. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. And uh, in terms of the value, neither the board or the city manager will be assessing value. It's, it's based on third party invoices. Yeah. So another concept is a master plan could be presented <clears throat> um, so that you, you are generally on the same page as to what the vision is with a delegation to the city manager who will clearly reach out to you. If he's the least bit concerned about it, he'll reach out to you. And if he's still concerned, he'll bring it back to you. So that might be a way to make it a little more efficient so that you can at least see the big picture. So are you okay with us taking action on both of these leases as one item, or do we need to do them separately? Uh, as long as it's unanimous, both are fine. Okay. Well, I definitely would like to see something kind. <coughs> Mayor, ma'am. Call Master. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt a resolution approving a lease with the Newburn Baseball LLC for K for Park at 603 George Street. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the leases. Any further discussion? And if we're talking leases plural, not lease. Correct. Lease well, it says lease, lease here. I'm not sure. Where is the second lease? Is it, is it all the group together or under this? Yeah. Okay. So They're then a leases. Okay. You good with both of those? All I am. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Astor. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Alderman Das? Yes. Alderman Brinson? Yes. Alderman Creel? Yes. Alderman Royal? Yes. Mayor Odom? Yes. Motion carries. Looking forward to it. Uh, gentlemen, Thank this you. is uh, one, of those, one of those issues that have come before the city, and um, there was a lot of discussion about it, but it was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, I think once this thing gets done, everybody's going to enjoy it. So I look forward to working with you and watching some baseball. Thank you. Get your arms ready for first pitches, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to item number uh, 10. Consider adopting a resolution approving a general warranty deed between Habitat for Humanity of Craven County, Mark S. Thomas, and the city of Newburn for 1701 Acock Avenue. Mr. Hughes. 
In September of 2019, the city approved the conveyance of this property to the Habitat for Humanity for the purpose of developing affordable housing for low and moderate income family, families. Habitat has subsequently constructed a home on the property and intends to transfer the home to the buyer. By executing a deed to transfer ownership to this buyer, the city will release any rights retained under a transfer and reversion agreement between the city and Habitat. Board have questions on item number 10. If there's no discussion, I'd like to make a motion to approve the execution of a general warranty deed between Habitat for Humanity of Craven County, Mark Thomas, and the City of New Bern for 1701 Acock Avenue. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Best. Alderman Best? Yes. Alderman Brinson? Yes. Alderman Priel? Yes. Alderman Royal? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Mayor Odom. Yes, motion carries. Item number 11, consider adopting a resolution approving an amendment to the contract with T.A. Loving for the Stanley White Recreation Center project. Mr. Hughes. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, Chris Volcano, our architect with CPL, and Russ Gerganis with T.A. Loving, the contractor, to come up and, and talk through the change orders. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as the city manager said, my name is Chris Volcano. Uh, I'm an architect with uh, CPL Architects and Engineers. Uh, along with, with TA Loving, uh, CPL is here to present a summary uh, of the proposed changes to the, the cost of construction for, for your review and, and hopefully for your approval. Um, so I can kind of kick us off by just giving an overview um, of the summary of changes, a little bit of background information on, on how we got here. Um, and, and then hopefully enough information to, to kind of uh, answer any questions you may have. Um, in terms of uh, our first item uh, on the summary, uh, so there's the, the steel and joist changes. Um, this, is, this is really a, a function in, in the nature of delegated design. Um, so due to the fact that, th that this was a, a hard bid, uh, design bid build project, um, a majority of the subcontractors and the shop drawings are coordinated once we have a general contractor on board. Uh, so with our current project delivery system, you know, how does this play into the steel? Uh, so the, the precast concrete um, that, that makes up the building envelope, uh, that is considered a delegated design. So there's a specialty engineer that, that designs those panels. Um, and so the, the engineering calculations for the precast panels can't be completed until uh, a contract is awarded to a general uh, contractor in this case, and then those, those calculations can be finalized and the, and the steel can be uh, matched up to make sure that the, the loading, um, as well as any of the connections, are, are adequate for, for what needs to be done. Um, so the, the change order that you're seeing for this portion of the project um, is that there were several um, changes that needed to be made to the precast concrete by those engineers um, and that the connections were then updated and the, and the loading was updated with it. Um, in terms of the unsuitable soils, um, the, the city's third party testing agency identified just over 2,000 uh, cubic yards of unsuitable soils on site. Um, those soils were removed and replaced uh, per the proof rolling observation report uh, provided by Terracon. Um, and they were priced according to the unit prices that were set forth in the, uh, the owner contractor agreement uh, that was based on the, um, the bid package uh, supplied by TA Loving. Uh, so the, the additional soils that were needed uh, were needed for the structural fill around the foundations of the building. Uh, the unsuitable soils weren't going to be, uh, be able to, to do the job, so we had uh, additional soils that were needed to, to be brought in. Um, finally, the, the step footing changes are, are, the, are the last kind of big piece in the summary. Um, this was an effort in, in on-site constr uh, construction and coordination um, with the building systems uh, and the structural footings. So with the locations of the, uh, the site utilities um, and where those connections are made to the, the first floor of the building, um, all of the utilities coming out of the building needed a clear path to get to where the, those site utilities were existing. So additional excavation and concrete needed to be done in a few different locations around the building to make sure that the, um, 
the, the footer actually drop below those utilities so that they can pass through uh, the concrete wall. Um, so due to some of these kind of unforeseen conditions and some of the, these coordination items, uh, we're requesting that the proposed changes and updates be, be approved in, in change order one. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have, but, but this is just kind of a, a summary of those changes. Oh, McKenzie. So the soil that was there, so it could not hold the weight of the building is what you're saying? So you had to remove that and bring some soil in? Yeah, more or less. Ross, I don't know if you want to weigh in on this, but yeah, uh, essentially the, the soil that needed to be used to backfill around the foundations and, and to be used to support the building needs to be able to have a certain soil bearing capacity. Is that around the whole entire building? So the, the unsuitable soils um, that they found were actually, there's a, there's a stormwater control um, vault that's in, that's in the parking lot that helps to manage the, uh, the stormwater. Um, so it's a, it's a concrete vault structure, and um, through excavating that, that's where they, they couldn't uh, place uh, the, the actual foundations for that stormwater control vault, uh, as well as the area that's in front of the job trailer right now. Uh, for the for the main entry drive, so those couldn't support the loads that that were required. So that's the that's the weight bearing of the column that, that I guess the wall that sets up. Normally, those type of walls they build warehouses with. Is that correct? The type of wall that they're building out there, they normally do warehouses with that. It's it's similar. Uh, so they do a lot of like if you're if you're talking about like tilt up construction, so where they they kind of pour the wall. Um, on the ground in front of the facility, and then they just tilt that wall up. Correct. This is this is similar, but these these panels are actually cast in a factory in a, a climate controlled environment, and then they're brought out to the site via truck. So, how strong is that wall versus that wall? Because normally you see them on, in big cities when they build these big warehouses. They just you know they put them up. It's a cheap way of doing that. So, I, I was wondering what is the the, the 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 weight structure of that there? I know it's it, it past cold, but uh, I didn't know how we come up with a design, design like that. I was just curious. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a balance. You know, when we were brought on to do this project, you know, we, we wanted to find a system that was not only, you know, durable and could withstand the test of time, but also was cost efficient and a little bit easier in terms of a, a streamlined construction uh, method. <laughs> so it was, it's a little bit of both in trying to balance to make sure that, you know, the facility is durable, um, you know, with the concrete. Uh, those walls are 12 inches thick. Uh, part of that is insulation that we need for energy code, but the other, you know, the other part of it is is load bearing concrete. So um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they're they're very sturdy. Okay. We have questions. This is for city manager. So the uh, the change order, the 172, that would come out of fund balance. Is that how that works? Because the rest of it is. So we did have a project uh, over. account for this, so it will come out of that project. So oh, okay. It would not come out of the that overage. Amount. Okay. Yes. Uh, any, any change orders outside of the uh, of the initial contract price do have to come back, but we do have funds to cover this. Okay. So you think it'll be any more hidden costs coming out? Yes. Coming up. Oh yeah. Guarantee yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you. How much more you think? <laughs> no, I'm you the expert. I'm just asking questions. Well, as your contractor, uh, under contract in the city of Newburgh, we're doing our best now. Uh, looking at every, coming everything over, making sure we identify those, how we can identify any potential savings to offset that. That could have been, you know, missed on, on, on bid day. But, I, I mean, there, in the course of construction, things do change, connection details field or different what they may be on an on actual plan, uh, but we're going to do our, job, uh, our best to make sure we don't have to come back in front of us. So are we still on schedule mm -hmm. to open up? On schedule? Uh, so far, yes, sir. Okay, very good. And, and as you may remember, when we were going through this process, um, we had to follow FEMA federal guidelines and they would not allow us to do construction manager at risk or design build process so we did have to go through the design bid build process which unfortunately brings change orders like this okay. and and just to note there there are some um, credits that's come through with this change order it's not all overcharges so somebody is doing a good job trying to find something so very good
Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt a resolution approving an amendment to the contract with T.A. Loving for the Stanley White Recreation Center project. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Brinson. Alderman Brinson? Yes. Alderman Priel? Yes. Alderman Royal? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Alderman Bess? Yes. Mayor Odom? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Item number 12 is discussion of BP building change and scope of work. Mr. Hughes. Okay. So as you remember, back in November of 2023, we talked about FEMA allocating $955,812.07 toward the rebuilding of the BP building uh, on Oaks Road. Just as a sidebar, that building was taken down last week. Um, and so we talked about a possible change in scope of work. So we came up with a variety of options for the board to consider. And some of those options included, included putting some funds toward an amphitheater, possibly a fire station, a fire truck, a grounds maintenance facility for parks and recreation, or public works facility, or a skid steer. And so as we talk through each of those things, the majority of those things are going to cost more than a million dollars. And so um, when it comes to an amphitheater, we were really looking at a couple of million for that project. Well, then we talked about the fire station. We're not quite there yet for a fire station. We know that's going to be coming to West Newburn, um, but we're still working on our due diligence. Then we talked about a fire truck. Currently there is a fire truck in this year's budget. We also talked during our budget discussions earlier in 2023 about the potential of buying two fire trucks that we would have to come back to the board for additional funding. Then we talked about a grounds maintenance facility for parks and recreation. Um, and of course, that's going to be coming up at some point uh, with them. And then possibly talking about a public works facility, moving public works out to possibly where water resources is and building the structure. But uh, the, the prices we looked at for that were about $3 million. Um, and then, of course, uh, the equipment that uh, was brought up was. Uh, really about $100,000. Uh, additional projects for consideration were street paving, additional parking at Pleasant Hill Community Center, and in general using the remaining funds to pay. So we're at the point now where um, you need to hear the board's comments on what you would like for us to um, make the request to FEMA for. Uh, and there is a process for this. Uh, once the board does decide on what, what project they would like to do or projects, we would write this up. We would send it to FEMA. Um, it could take three to six months before we'd, we would hear back from them. So just, just so you know that. Mayor, may I speak? Sure. Um, members of the board, whatever we do with this funding, I certainly recommend that it would make life easier for us and working with the state as well as FEMA if we utilize all of this money on one project. It would be only one scope of change, a change of scope of work. Um, we wouldn't have to break it up in several different projects and have several different changes of scope of works, which each one of them could take uh, who knows how long to get approved. Um, it would be less money for our consultant to write up the change of scope of work. And we also are kind of limited as to what we can and cannot use these funds for. You know, um, personally, and I've, I've looked at this stuff up one end down the other, we have money budgeted for a fire truck. If we utilize these funds, which could be easily passed through FEMA, um, to purchase this fire truck with, we could then take the money that we had budgeted to purchase the fire truck and take care of some of these other smaller projects and smaller ideas that the board members had. Um, the fire truck is important at this point in time because there's a price increase of, I think, two and a half percent February 1st. That's correct. So we need to make a decision on the fire truck one way or the other real soon. Or we're going to have a, a, a major price increase 
on it. Um, talking to Corey and talking to our um, counterparts in the state of North Carolina, they think the fire truck would probably be very easy to pass through FEMA. Again, the big thing is, is don't break this money up into two or three different projects. That would be very complicated to try to get um, passed, uh, and it would be separate scopes of work done for each, one for each project. So I would love to see us just go ahead and utilize the money that we, that to purchase the fire truck with, and then utilize the funds that we budgeted for the fire truck to do some of these other projects that some of the board members have. Foster, what was the total cost of demolition of the, of the building? Do you know what the total cost was? I know it was previously stated $20,000. You had the full price yet, George? Um, uh, the problem, I think, was right around $17,000. That Approximately was that, seventeen thousand. Was that forced labor? That's yes, forced labor. Okay. Um, Alderman Astor, uh, you made a good point there about um, using all this money for one project. Only problem I have with that is that um, you can see it was stated here um, that what I felt like some of the funds should be um, geared towards and it was for paving of streets. And I don't have a problem with that, using all that money for one project, as long as I know that these streets are gonna get paid. And, and you're saying taking this money that we allocated for, I mean, that we, for the fire truck to get some of these projects done. Now, who can authorize that? Who can say that that well, is? Well, where are these streets, George? Where are <laughs> these streets on the list? I mean, how, how far down the list I'm, are they, and when will they be able to get paid? Uh, but looking at the survey, the street survey, yeah. it some, was about the, 50, it was about 50, but I'm, when I looked at it, I, I calculated about $60,000 to get those four streets paid. Right, and, and uh, I will put a caveat to that. That was based on the construction estimates from LaBella who did that, the pavement condition survey five years ago. Right. Um, and so, one, you would expect the prices to, to go up, and two, there may be now additional um, deficiencies in that roadway that they mentioned. And I will let you know that LaBella actually has their sur survey vehicles in town right now. They should be here for the next 10 days. And we expect to report back at the end of February and we'll have uh, their engineer come do a presentation on their findings. Um, but, you know, a million dollars of, of paving is, is certainly possible throughout all of the wards very easily to address some of the known deficiencies. So, George, does that mean all streets, will all the streets be certified to let us know which is the worst ones that really yes, need to be Yes, they go through all 177 miles of road. Okay. We'll have a rating for every street by block. Okay, so this is a new? Yes, ma'am, it's an updated, okay. an updated report. Right. Because since 2018, that first survey was done, we've had a lot of damage, water damage and everything, hurricanes coming through here that's really... You're exactly right. And I, th I think we had that survey done, and then we had Florence, and I think we might have seen some delayed structure issues with it that from being inundated and flooded for, for in certain areas that we're now seeing a year, two, three, four, five years later after the storm, um, the subgrades had some serious issues. How much money was allocated for the roads in, in the budget? Resurfacing, resurfacing. How much money in the previous budget? I believe we had another 400000 for this year, yes, ma'am. But well, didn't we add to that because of sidewalk? Didn't we remove some sidewalk money and add the pavement? Yeah, I, bl I believe we backed the sidewalk down. Because I right. think it was like an additional 200000 right. that we... Yep. We've got a, we've got a, a balance right now of right over six hundred from what okay. we had, from our rollover from the Duffy Field. Um, Which won't do a whole lot of streets, but that, it's more no, than what we originally had. And yeah, and, and the city manager had asked me about that this evening. So I can give you an example, and this is uh, uh, just an example of one street. If you take a 22-foot wide road, which has got curb and gutter, um, to mill that road an inch and a half and put back an inch and a half pavement is about $120 a linear foot. Um, so when you're talking about a, a million dollars, we can do just over a mile and a half of that type street. 
we get into Duffy Field where we had to remove the entire street, regrade it, improve the subgrade, costs are different. So each road brings its own, own issue. Yeah. And you said this report will be ready when? Uh, we're anticipating it be ready at the end of February where we will receive it and we'll have their engineer come down and give a presentation to the board once they're complete. Thank you. I, I don't have a problem with all the master's recommendation and we address the uh, paving after February when we uh, have the new report. Mayor, yeah, if I can. Sure. Um, my, my thought process, I think, probably reflects um, more on the, the experience that I've had in other jurisdictions um, where we need to be looking in-house, um, especially when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands or you know millions of dollars investment made in equipment in vehicles <clears throat> and whether or not we are taking responsible and proper actions to maintain the integrity of that equipment that and that rolling stock and what i'm really getting at is <clears throat> We, we've talked on a few occasions now about the need that exists for parks and maintenance or, or grounds maintenance. And I reached out to, to Foster earlier today just to get an idea as to the, the equipment that is used in that particular operation, how much of that is housed in a, a, at least a garage structure versus just being left out in the weather year round. And Foster's reply was that mowers are kept indoors to protect them, but um, the other equipment, the larger pieces of equipment and, and vehicles uh, are kept outdoors. And I don't know, but I suspect that you know, if we talk to public works and electric utility and water and sewer utilities, we're probably looking at the same situation where we don't have enough garage facilities to house this very expensive um, stock that we have of equipment and vehicles, which in turn is causing the city to have to invest more money to repair and replace these vehicles and equipment than if they were housed in at least a roofed structure, if not a fully enclosed structure. We know we have a need for parks and grounds maintenance. Um, we just adopted a recreation master plan which highlighted the need for a new facility to house parks and, and grounds maintenance equipment. I would prefer to see this FEMA money <coughs> go towards that project it, again, it's a down payment because of the cost of building or acquiring a facility. It's not going to be covered by um, the FEMA reimbursement, but it would be a large step forward to making that happen. What I, I don't have, um, I guess, the answer to, and Foster, maybe you could you know, um, talk about this a little bit, before parks and grounds maintenance could move into the public works facility, public works facility needs to vacate it and move somewhere else. So That's correct. It's, <coughs> one has to happen before the other can happen. That's correct. Um, so we're talking about a major undertaking to um, 
make that happen. But if we don't start moving forward with that now, um, the cost is just going to continue to increase until a, a decision is made. And a decision does need to be made on that. The same way we've talked about the need for a new fire station, um, kind of in the West Newburgh <coughs> area. Um, we've talked about it, but we really haven't gotten into a serious discussion about it up to this point. Um, and we need to. And the cost is going to continue to go up until a final decision is made. So we need to start investing and we need to start talking about and I think reinvesting in the city's needs um, internally, um, not just looking externally as to um, other projects that can maybe be done. So where I'm coming out on this is, is trying to focus on not only the near term but also just the long term needs. Um, of the city in terms of our own facilities. Anyone else? Um, Foster, is there any conceptual plans for a new fire station that I know I haven't seen any or where any's been? Is there any in the works or when is that? The, the former fire chief did did work with uh, a local architect on some plans, and it was a combined police fire. And so we we can definitely share that with the board. We may just do that during the um, during the workshop that we'll talk about shortly as well. Okay. <coughs> just a question for city manager on the concern that Alderman Prill brought up. Has there ever been, has staff ever expressed a concern or desire to have some sort of covered structure for vehicles? Um, for, for equipment, yes. Um, that, that has been the ongoing thing with Parks and Recreation. So uh, electric utility, they have a, a good amount of storage that they can park their trucks under public works as that as well. Um, Parks and Recreation, their area is at Glen Burnie Park. You can drive by there, and, and, and it's a rough-looking area. All the, all, everything is out in the elements for that. Um, the biggest thing with parks and recreation grounds maintenance is they, they need more space. It, it's coming sooner than later with that. Um, but the other issue is the location. Where is it going to go? Um, and even with FEMA funding, we couldn't. Eat. If the board wanted to go with what Alderman Member Prill is talking about, we've got to find property that is not in a flood zone. And, and in Newburn, there's quite a bit of flood areas around here. So a lot of things to look at. I mean, my thoughts or suggestion would be if you're going to relocate parks and ground, it should be probably be located somewhere on Mar Martin Marietta property, um, which is the largest park that we have. And there's ample space there. Um, but I, I was just curious because I don't ever recall a capital request or during the budget process hearing anything about covered shelter. I mean, I've heard about more space right. for that department, right. but not that specifically. So. Uh, when you're talking about that space, you're talking about actually a building, a facility that will house the Parks and Recs department as well, correct? That's correct. Okay. Which is grounds maintenance facility, which is what's listed here, but there's no, we don't have any estimates on costs. Is that correct? Off the top of my head, no. I think I had something in this. So public works facility, you had three and a half million dollars. That's, that's but, correct. But nothing for grounds maintenance. Nothing for grounds maintenance. That's correct. Okay. I thought that at one time, well, maybe I'm, that was discussed about putting it out at the 43 water resource at 43. We had discussed a long time ago. Mm -hmm. The plan internally had been discussed that Public Works would build a new facility out beside water resources. Parks and Recreation would move into the current area occupied by Public Works now. Mm -hmm. And so we did look at some numbers uh, within the last three or four months on what it would cost to build a similar uh, setup to what Public Works has now. And that, that ends up being about approximately $3 million for that. Which was 1.5 about five or six years ago. That's correct. In 2019, it was 1.5. I would I would just say what Alderman asked. I think we've tabled this item 
multiple times. Um, I'm glad to see the BP, BP building is finally down. Uh, it was an eyesore for sure. Um, it does certainly seem like the easiest path of least resistance for this funding, which is restricted, would be to move forward with the fire truck and then the money that we were going to spend on the fire truck, whether it's debt service or an you know, uh, outlay of cash, could be used on something that's unrestricted. So we get our, you know, if, we're, if we were planning on financing this fire truck and it was $100,000 in debt service a year for 10 years, then we could say essentially we want to take $100,000 for the next 10 years and add it to streets and ground maintenance if we wanted to because then it would be flexible to do so. Is that fair? Okay. Yes, it is. Or paving. Yeah, that's what I meant. Streets and grounds. Yeah, okay. paving. Or paving. Because my thing here is you got, we got the 600 some thousand dollars already allocated for paving of streets for fiscal year 24. So here you go again. We're kicking the, our streets down the, our paving of our citizens' streets down the road again. I, you know, I, we sit here and we talk about. And I don't have a problem with using this money for a fire station. I don't I mean for a fire truck. I don't have a problem with that. As long as I know that these, we've had this study done in 2018. Now we're here to have an updated one. And then it comes to where I look at the streets within Ward 5 because I travel down to some of those streets and I see the dire need for paving. And then it don't get done for another year or two. And then... George, George, do you yes. remember the, the last survey we had? Did they give us an estimate on what it would cost to bring all the streets up to? I thought there was a number on there, wasn't it? Was it 10 or $12 million? Is that it, was, it was a steep amount. I know I'm putting you on the spot. But. <laughs> yeah, they, they, there were two separate numbers in there of, of a cost to, for all the repairs in their, in their uh, assessment. And then there was also some some projected costs that we should be spending a year to keep up with the mileage of roads that we have currently. Um, and I, I, I would wait until we're, you know, we're four or five weeks out from having those new numbers. Um, I, I, you know, hate to rely on a five-year-old number to say that, but we've got 177 miles of road. Um, the dollar does not go as far as it used to in resurfacing these roads. So. Um, I, I can much, pave as much as y'all y'all will give me. How's that? How much pound bill money do we get annually? Not enough. No, no. A little over one million dollars right now. And what do we do with that? Um, the majority of it does go to paving, some sidewalks, um, staffing. Correct. Yeah, they've got, it's all got, it's all power bill eligible work, uh, right away mowing those types of things that are all included okay. in power bill coverage. Okay. Well, what do you need? Do you need a motion on what to do with this money? It'll be helpful, I believe. Yes. Then, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we utilize the BP FEMA funds to purchase the fire truck and try to get the purchase done before February 1st price increase. Second. I have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? Um, hearing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Prill. Can I add here something sure. before we do that? We're saying the motion to purchase the fire truck with the FEMA money. Correct. And so do we need to add that and the money that we have utilize it for? Change in scope of work um, for a fire truck is what we need. Okay, you want me to rephrase it then? Yes. All right. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we change the scope of work to purchase a new fire engine um, for the New Bern Fire Department. Is that all you need? That's all we need. And we can come back, if the board approves this, we can come back later regarding the, the funding on the other part to determine how the board will Are like we going to have another meeting before this price increase? We are not going to have another meeting. Um, so, so thinking through this, currently we have the funds in the budget to purchase the fire truck. And this is one of the things we kind of talked through with our consult. Yes, we would probably have to go ahead and, and to take advantage of that, of that amount. Uh, well, I, I'm talking about to approve the purchase of the fire truck. It's, it's in the budget. It's already approved. The, the fire truck purchase is already in the budget. There are already funds, so the, okay. that would not have to come back to the board. Okay. Alderman Brinson, are you good with the restated motion? Yes. Okay. Second. 
Everyone good? Okay. Let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Prill. Alderman Prill? No. Alderman Royal? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Alderman Bess? Yes. Alderman Brinson? Yes. Mayor Odom? Yes. Motion carries. Now, I, I want to go back to my question. Do we need any... <coughs> Any motion or any uh, voice vote or whatever to say the money that has been budgeted for the fire truck will be used for the roads or we don't, we're not I, there yet. I would recommend we come back at a future meeting on that. <coughs> All right. Probably the workshop. In a budget session. We, we can yeah. do the budget okay. workshop most likely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, we decided to table item number 13. I, I did have, think about a concern here. Uh, the attorney is typically not present at a budget workshop, and uh, the motion was made to table item number 13 to the budget workshop that we're going to have. Um, I don't know how deep, I mean, I, I've looked at the rules and procedures, and they're, they're very generic, to be honest with you. I don't know how deep we plan on getting into a discussion about that, but we may just want to consider that we will not have counsel there if there gets to be any legal questions regarding that discussion. We can always just discuss it, and if we decide to have changes, it could come back before us at a future time. But I just think we need to be aware if we're talking about changing rules and procedures, which is something very legalistic, um, we, we won't have an attorney present. So I just want to make that note. But I have a question. <clears throat> sure. If, since you said the attorney's not present, if we come to a uh, that part of a disagreement or how we're making this discussion, can we contact you, Attorney Davis? Yes, ma'am, always. Okay. Always, okay, all right. Okay, um, item number 14 is appointments, and it looks like the only one that I see is the ex officio uh, for this governing board to appoint for the MSD. Is anyone prepared to make that appointment tonight? Does somebody I think we're want to volunteer? I mean, well, do we have one person or more than one on the board that would like to serve in that capacity? The question was, you know, how often are they meeting? And um, I guess is that has that been established? I don't remember quick all. So the first meeting will be next Monday. At that mm -hmm. time, we'll set the meeting schedule for the year. Okay. And quarterly. It will be quarterly. Quarterly. Okay. Unless there's some specific projects that the, the group wants to discuss on a more frequent basis. My, my thought process, uh, you know, instead of uh, appointing an alderman, I, I think it should be filled by the mayor pro tem. That way that position gets rotated uh, yearly as we rotate the mayor pro tem as well. Just as a suggestion. Know, I'm not sure I understand why we would single out one member of the the board if if there are any other members that might have an interest. It's just a suggestion. I don't have an interest, so I'll clear my name from the. I, I, I have I have an interest, but I just don't uh, like the fact that I have <laughs> no voting power. Well, can sit there all day to discuss, let's, let's, discuss, let's be very discuss. clear here. This is the MSD Advisory Committee. I know. This board is ultimately going to make every decision that comes to us. So, this is going around in circles for as I'm concerned. You know, if if you got a committee here and then you can't, you know, you can't vote on this any particular items, and then it's got to come back to this board. But Attorney Davis, what if no one on this board desires to fill that slot? Well, it would it would just remain unfilled and. Um, and then I guess the question for you is the resolution that creates the MSD provides for that fifth ex officio seat. Um, and it might be nice to clean that up if you, we got some oh, and for the reflection, decide you don't want it. You said quarterly are the meetings? Quarterly. Could be more, but Could no be. less than quarterly. Yeah. <clears throat> Until the advisory committee meets and decide how often they want to meet, we don't know. If it's quarterly, I'll do it. <laughs> if it's not quarterly, we'll go back to order and best. <laughs> then we defer this until after the MSD meets 
and then we'll know. Sure. Do you want a motion? <laughs> what do you mean you come back to Auburn Best? Do you need it as a motion? As? No. no. It, it, a motion to appoint someone, nothing just kicks the can down the road with a, now, with a vacancy. I like motion, make motion that we appoint Auburn Royal. She seems to have an interest. <laughs> Second. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, now a second. We have, we have a motion and a second. I thought, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't this the position that we created because there was some concern about having some diversity? Yeah, that was a yeah. concern you raised. Is, that, is this the yeah. same position? Yes, sir. Because yes, okay. I had completely forgot about it because when I saw it on the agenda, I, I was like, didn't we appoint everybody for this MSD thing already? So I, I forgot about it. So, <laughs> All right, well, we got a motion and a second. Um, you can always vote no on the Royal if you don't want to do it. But uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Uh, you opposed it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I feel like y'all pressure her into this. <laughs> okay. I promise you, no one can pressure me. Madam Clerk, did you get that? Uh, we I have did. one in opposition. One, one nay. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other appointments that I didn't see? Okay. Uh, attorney's report. Uh, nothing to report tonight, Mayor. City Manager's report. Just one item, just a reminder that on February 6th, we'll have our budget retreat at, uh, at 9 a.m. here in the courtroom. At that meeting, the department heads will be presenting uh, personnel and capital uh, requests to a PowerPoint. Uh, and so at that, you'll be basically kind of keeping up on the information that uh, the finance director gives you on those things, on what you're going to support, uh, have a flavor for supporting and not as we continue through our budget process. Foster, you said February 6, 9 to what? 9 until. Okay. Until it's done. Yeah. So I better take off that day, right? I'll bring you a pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? That's it. All right. Uh, new business, Alderman Prill. Uh, I have nothing, Mayor. Right. Alderman Royal? None tonight. Alderman Master. <laughs> Mayor, I'd just like to thank um, George and his team for the hard work and off New Chantel Drive, where we had some issues with flooding over there as a result of a um, cable company of some sort went through one of our pipes and created a snag. They, I felt bad they were out there in knee deep water and trying to repair a pipe and replace pipe, and it just it just makes me think about the reason why we pay our guys and why we should keep them happy because of services like that because I certainly wouldn't <coughs> be down there doing it. And other than that, um, I have nothing else. All right. Uh, Alderman Bess. Um, I, too, want to thank you, George, you and your staff um, in reference to um, a little issue that just come up this week and you was very amenable to me and the citizens. So thank you and your staff. That's it, sir. Alderman Brinson. Uh, the only thing I have is, uh, you know, we've I've talked about Reese Across America a couple of months now. Uh, the Reese Across America mobile exhibit is coming to New Bern on February 3rd and 4th, basically uh, explaining the, the purpose of Reese Across America, uh, you know, live with, and their theme this year is live with a purpose. And so there is an opening ceremony. And we're also calling it a welcome home ceremony to honor Vietnam veterans. That will be at 9 a.m. February 3rd at Lawson Creek Park. And then the uh, <coughs> mobile will be open uh, basically from 9 until 3 on um, Saturday and Sunday. But again, opening ceremony at 9 uh, February 3rd at Lawson Creek Park if you want to come and participate. Okay. Uh, I have no new business tonight. Uh, do we need a closed session? Uh, yes, sir. We do. Um, briefly, um, trip to 143-1311-A5 to discuss the potential acquisition of real property. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're in closed session. <laughs> Is there any more business to come before the City of Newburgh Board of Aldermen this evening? No, sir. If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. A motion to adjourn and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed?